And we left off with Crayon harping, <laughs> essentially, about Antigone because of what? Why is he, one, so surprised, and two, so put out by her actions? She's a woman. How dare she? And he says, whoever steps out of line, violates the laws, presumes to hand out orders to his superiors, he'll win no praise from me. Why? Because that person essentially is leading to anarchy. 752. Show me a greater crime in all the earth. She. Notice, anarchy is a she in Crayon's mind. She. Destroys cities, rips up houses, breaks the ranks of spearmen into a headlong rout, etc., etc. Okay? And the leader says, Yeah, you seem to say what you have to say with sense. Seem. Anybody know what kind of verb that is? It's what's called a subjunctive. Okay? The subjunctive mood indicates a condition contrary to fact. Okay? Uh, Larry Flint seems to be a wholesome gentleman, if you know who Larry Flint is. Hugh Hefner seems to have been a good Christian man. Yeah, Carlton Graves, your face is giving it to me. Okay? It's a condition contrary fact. Uh, I won't use pop stars. Okay? So when you see that seems, it's, it always raises a question. Okay? Is it really? Take my Shakespeare course in the, in the spring, because Shakespeare loves this. He loves the interplay slash the conflict between appearance versus reality, which, by the way, you'll see is what we're going to see um, somewhat in the next reading we have of Plato. That's what Sophocles, excuse me, Socrates is all about. You seem to say what you have to say with sense. So what's he really saying? The leader. If seem is a condition contrary to fact, it looks like what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But looking like is not the same as, right? He's hedging. He's qualifying what he's saying. Haman. Father, only the gods endow a man with reason, the finest of all the gifts, a treasure. Far be it from me, I, I don't have the skill, certainly no desire to tell you when, if ever, you make a slip in speech. Someone else might have a good suggestion. In other words, um, leader, come on. You guys are older than me. You're wiser than me. You ought to be stepping up here. He says, um, it's not for you to watch whatever men say or do or find to criticize. It's not for you, he is saying, to listen to the people of the city. No, that's my job. It's for me to catch the murmurs in the dark, the way the city mourns for this young girl. Okay, keep in mind, who is this young girl to Haman? Fiance. No woman, they say, ever deserved death less. And such a brutal death for such a glorious action. <coughs> so notice what Haman is saying. The city is saying about what Antigone did. It was a glorious action. Death, he says, 782. According to the people in the city, she deserves a glowing crown of gold. So they say. And the rumor spreads in secret, darkly. Nobody will say it to Crayon's face. Why? See, they're scared of him. I rejoice in your success, Father. Nothing more precious to me in the world. Okay, 
you've heard this kind of language before, or you've seen it, you know, people talking to presidents, talking to people of positions of power, they praise to do what? To then come down and offer a little suggestion. But maybe you can... Now, don't please be quite so single-minded, self-involved, or assume the world is wrong and you are right. Notice, I rejoice in your success. There's nothing more precious. But, don't be what? A self-righteous, arrogant ass. Father, whoever thinks that he alone possesses intelligence, the gift of eloquence, he and no one else, and character too, so intelligence, gift of eloquence, and character, such men, I tell you, spread them open, slit them open, you will find them empty. People who think they have all the answers, Haman is saying, don't have them at all. It's no disgrace for a man, even a wise man, to learn many things and not to be too rigid. Okay? Even a wise man has got to what? Learn. Be adaptable. Give way. Relax your anger, 805. Change. I'm young, I know, but let me offer this. It would be best by far, I admit, if a man were born infallible, right by nature. If not, and things don't often go that way, it's best to learn from those with good advice. If you saw the winter's tale, Crayon is being like Leontes at the beginning of the play. He is damn sure he is right. His wife has been sleeping with the other king. And what happens? As soon as he pronounces judgment, when he says, the oracle is not true, there's thunder. And he's now suddenly convinced, oh, sorry, Apollo, didn't mean to step on your uh, parade there. You're right. And quickly, what happens? Messenger comes out. Your son is dead. She dies, apparently. Give way. Relax your anger. Change. Do well, my lord. You do well, my lord, if he's speaking to the point to learn from him. But what did the leader just say prior to Haman's long speech? Hmm. What you say kind of makes sense about what Crayon said. Well, what Haman just said is the exact opposite of what Crayon said. Logic tells us what? They can't both be true. They can't both be right. And the leader saying, Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. That's a very... What's the leader not want to do? Okay. Take a stand. <laughs> You're both talking sense. No, the leader's talking nonsense in saying that. Crayon. So, men our age, because Crayon is the age of the leader, or close to, we're to be lectured, schooled, by a boy his age? See, Haman's teens? Only what is right, Haman replies. If I seem, seem young, look less to my years and more to what I do. Do? Am I to look to your admiring rebels? Is that an achievement? No, it's not what I'm saying. The whole city of Thebes denies it. To a man. That is, that what Antigone did was rebellion. And is Thebes about to tell me how to rule? I, I thought this was a democracy. No, it's not. It's a tyranny. Okay. Now you see who's talking like a child. Notice how Haman turns the tables there. Is Thebes, Crayon asks, about to tell me how to rule? No, he's talking like a child. Am I to rule this land for others or myself? What's the answer? Yes. <laughs> it is for both. Haman, it's no city at all owned by one man alone. 
In other words, Crayon would be a great king where? Hamlet kind of says the same thing, by the way. I could be a king of infinite power if I were bounded in a nutshell. That is, if he was the only thing there, Crayon would be a wonderful king on a deserted island by himself. Where everything he said would hold sway. What? The city is the king's, Cran says. That's the law. What a splendid king you'd make of a desert island. You and you alone. This boy's fighting on her side, the woman's side. If you are a woman, that's really not the smartest approach to take there on Haman's part. If you are a woman, yes, my concern is all for you. What is he saying, though? I'm not defending Antigone. I am trying to take your part. How? By supporting everything his father says? Is that what a wise presidential advisor does? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Trump. Just get on that phone and tweet away. Or get on that telephone and call Kim Jong-un, little rocket man. That, I'm sure he loves to hear that, you know. Or, no. What does a wise presidential advisor do? Stop, <laughs> Mr. President. Whoever the president is, don't do this. Okay? Why? Because they're looking out for that person's best interest. Haman is looking out for his father's best interest. Otherwise, he's going to have the city against him. Why are you degenerate? Think about what that word means. Degenerate. It means that he's falling away from what generated him. Crayon. So Crayon is saying, you're not like me anymore. Bandying accusations, threatening me with justice. Your own father. How dare you? Could you see Telemachus doing this with Odysseus? Not really. I see my father offending justice. What kind of justice? the unwritten traditions of the state. The same kind of justice. Sof Socrates, man, I'm going to do that all day. Socrates is going to talk about to some extent. Wrong. Wrong to protect my royal rights. That is, it's wrong to protect myself. Protect your rights when you trample down the honors of the gods. He's saying, you know, these are not two equal things. The honors of the gods... When it comes in comparison to human values, always takes what? Precedence. Honors of the gods, honoring the gods, following the gods, always comes first. You, you woman's accomplice. Maybe, but you'll never find me accomplice to a criminal. I might be a woman's accomplice. She's not an accomplice. Excuse me. She's not a criminal. Why? She's following the honors of the gods, the traditions of the gods. That's what she is. Crayon disagrees. Every word you say is a blatant appeal for her. And you and me and the gods beneath the earth. Why in you and me? What's, Crayon, what's Haman suggesting? What is the central fact of life? <laughs> Death. Haman is saying, dear old dad, I'm defending you and myself when we die. How would you like it if when you die, because of your actions, the city doesn't honor your death? You will never marry her, not while she's alive. Then she will die, but her death will kill another. Brazen threats? How does Cram take that, her death will kill another? He thinks Haman's threatening him. Haman doesn't mean that at all. What, what threat? You'll suffer for your sermons. If you weren't my father, I'd say you were insane. So why doesn't he anyways, you know? You really expect to fling abuse at me and not receive the same? She 
She'll die now in front of her groom. In other words, you're going to watch her die. Nope, not me. Haman, she'll never die beside me. Don't delude yourself. You'll never see me. Never set eyes on my face again. Rage your heart out. Rage with friends who can stand the sight of you. He rushes out. What does the leader say? You better go after him. Tempered, young as he is. So they talk a little bit. So what do you plan for Antigone? The leader asks Crayon. Well, take her down some desolate, wild, rocky path. Find a cave. Put her in that cave. There, let her pray to the god she worships. Death. Chorus comes in. Antigone's brought under palace guard. And the chorus sings as Antigone is brought in. But now even I would rebel against the king. I would break all bounds when I see this. I fill with tears. I cannot hold them back. I see Antigone make her way to the bridal vault where all are laid to rest. We all essentially become death's mate. All right? So she talks about going to wed death and the chorus again. A law to yourself. See, Haman said, you need to learn to adapt. But he doesn't say that to her. Why? You can't adapt to this law, to this unwritten tradition. It has to be fulfilled. Antigone thinks of Niobe, line 915 or so. And you got the footnote about Niobe. And the chorus says, yeah, but she was a god, born of God. You can't compare yourself with her. We're only mortals, what, born to die. See, gods aren't born to die. Gods are born. They can be born, but then they go on. They, they never stop living. You went too far, 943 or so, the chorus says. The last limits of daring smashing against the high throne of justice. Justice is here capitalized. Does that mean it's justice personified? Does that mean it's the idea, the platonic idea of justice? Or is it justice as in a court, a law, a department of justice, like crayons justice? Your life's in ruins, child. I wonder, do you pay for your father's terrible ordeal? And she's like, there it is. I knew somebody was going to bring it up. And she thinks about going down to death and seeing what? Dear old dad and my brother, dear old mom and my other brother, <laughs> grandfather. Oh, mother, your marriage bed, the coiling horrors, the coupling there, you with your own son, my father, doomstruck mother, such, such were my parents, and I, their wretched child. I go to them now. Chorus, reverence as some reverence in return, but attacks on power never go unchecked. In other words, surely there is a way you could work around this. But how helpful has the chorus been in its other speeches? They keep trying to straddle that fence. Not by the man who holds the reins of power. Your own blind will, your passion has destroyed you. Has it? Is her passion like Oedipus's rashness? Crayon. Can't you see if a man could wail his own dirge before he dies, he'd never finish? What's he mean? All right, bring it to an end. He's saying if we let her keep talking, what's going to happen? She'll keep talking. She won't stop. So, Antigone says, next page, about 985 or so. She's ready to die. Why? Because she's cherishing one good hope. My arrival may be dear to father, dear to you, my mother. Dear to you, my loving brother, Atanacles, when you died, I washed you with my hands. I dressed you all. That is, she helped perform the funeral rites for all the dead members of her family. But now, Polynices, because I laid your body out as well, 
This, this is my reward. I honored you. But she says, I wouldn't have done this. If what? If I had been the mother of children. Or if my husband died, suppose rotting, I'd never have taken this ordeal upon myself, never defied our people's will. What law, you ask, do I satisfy myself with? A husband dead? There's always been another. A child dead? There could have always been another till a certain age. But mother and father, both lost in the halls of death, I could never have any brothers again. And they're both dead. She's saying, this is why I had to do that. For this, Crayon the king judges me a criminal, guilty of dreadful outrage, my dear brother. And now he leads me off, a captain of his, in his hands, with no part in the bridal song. And I'll never wed and never have children. I descend alive to the caverns of the dead. What law of the mighty gods have I transgressed? She's asking the chorus in Crayon, come on. Show me. Pull out the God's law books. Show me what laws I've transgressed. Why look to the heavens anymore, tormented as I am? Whom to call? What comrades now? In other words, she's saying, I don't have any defenders. Just think, my reverence only brands me for irreverence. How is she using the two terms? Her reverence for what? The unshakable, unwritten traditions. The laws of how to deal with the dead. Her reverence for that, for the gods, essentially. Brands her for irreverence. Irreverence towards what? Crayon, his leadership, human law, the power of the state, all those things. Very well. If this is the pleasure of the gods, once I suffer... I will know that I was wrong. That is, once I'm dead, I'll know. If I was wrong, okay. But if I'm not, <laughs> if these men are wrong, who's the these men? Is it just Crayon? No, she's you know putting together Crayon and the chorus because the chorus isn't doing anything to stop him. If these men are wrong, let them suffer nothing worse than they meet out to me. Let them die a similar death, these masters of injustice. Still the same rough winds, the wild passion raging through the girl. Notice the leader doesn't address anything she said. He's just like, it's just, you know, a sound and fury signifying nothing. A tale told by an idiot from Macbeth. Take her away. Crayon's tired of seeing her. So she goes off. And the chorus has a long speech. Tiresias comes in. I should be doing this a lot quicker. And he says, I'm here for one reason. Crayon, what's the news? Well, I'll teach you. And you obey the seer. I have never wavered from your advice before. All right, you're poised on the razor edge of fate. I shudder to hear you. So, Tiresias says, I was sitting there doing my craft, my augury, and here's what I saw. 11.23 or so. It's you, your high resolve, that sets this plague on Thebes. In other words, a plague is descended on Thebes just like the plague that descended on Thebes under Oedipus' rule. Everything's dying. Okay. So, he says, 1131, Take these things to heart, my son, I warn you. All men make mistakes. It is only human. But once the wrong is done, a man can turn back on folly, misfortune too. If he tries to make amends, however low he's fallen, and stops his bull-necked ways. Tiresias is saying, you know what? It is possible to turn around. 
to go the other direction. Stubbornness brands you for stupidity. Pride is a crime. What's one of the internet memes that's you know making its way on Facebook and stuff? What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting what? A different outcome. Okay? That's stupidity. Yield to the dead. Never stab the fighter when he's down. Never stab the corpse. Which is why in, in Shakespeare's Henry IV, part two, part one. Henry IV, part one, which is why when Prince Hal kills Hotspur and then leaves the body, Falstaff gets up because he's been pretending to be dead. And he stabs Hotspur because he tells to himself, you know, perchance he is like me and is merely pretending to be dead. But the only problem there is Hotspur is not a coward like Falstaff is. He's really dead. And so Falstaff has just essentially desecrated the body. Never stab the fighter when he's down. Where is the glory killing the dead twice over? I mean you will. I give you sound advice. It's best to learn from a good advisor. Crayon. You too? I have him loosed on me, this fortune teller. What did he say when Ty Tiresias first spoke to him? Uh, I've always taken your advice. Now he's just a fortune teller. Okay? So they go back and forth. Tiresias says, You're the one who's sick, Crayon, sick to death. I'm no mood to trade insults with the seer, with a seer. You have already, calling my prophecies a lie. Why not? You and the whole breed of seers are mad for money. See, Crayon's got to think about money, because he blamed, at the, very at the very first, somebody did this for money. Somebody buried the body for money. Okay? But what else is he doing? He's replaying the role of Oedipus in the first play. Okay? So they go back and forth. And finally, Tiresias says, okay, I'm getting ready to go. Line 1181. Then know this too, learn this by heart. The chariot of the sun will not race through so many circuits more before you have surrendered one born of your own loins, your own flesh and blood. A corpse for corpse is given in return. Since you have thrust to the world below, a child sprung for the world above. Ruthlessly lodge a living soul within the grave. Then you've robbed the gods below. The, so the first thing is you put somebody in a grave who shouldn't be there because they're not dead yet. Violation number one. Violation number two, you've robbed the gods below the earth, keeping a dead body here in the bright air, unburied, unsung, unhallowed. You have no business with the dead, nor do the gods above. This is violence you have forced upon the heavens. And so the Avengers, the dark destroyers, late but true to the mark, the Furies, they're coming for you. There, reflect on that. Take me on, boy. <laughs> and they leave. The leader. The old man's gone, my king. Terrible prophecies. Well, I know since the hair on this old head went gray, he's never lied. So, since the hair on this old head went gray, he's never lied. So 10 years, 20 years? Crayon, I know it too. I'm shaken, I'm torn. But it's a dreadful thing to yield. In other words, to back down. What are two of the hardest words to say? I'm sorry. Good advice. Take it now. What should I do? Tell me. Free the girl. Raise a mound for the body. Notice the order. Free the girl. Raise the mound. Why in that order? Okay, the body's dead. It's going to stay dead. But the girl is alive. Temporarily, at least. You think I should give in? Yes. It's hard giving up the heart's desire. Do it now. And so he does. He says, I'll do it now. And a messenger comes in. 
What grief do you bring the house of kings, the messenger, the leader asks. Dead, dead, and the living are guilty of their death. Haman's gone. His blood spilled by the very hand. Father's or his own? Own. Raging mad with his father's death. Okay. Eurydice then comes out. Or Eurydice. Leader, look at her. Poor woman, Crayon's wife, so close. Maybe she's heard something. The messenger tells her when she asks. And he says, so I escorted your Lord, line 13, 18 or so. I guided him to the edge of the plain where the body lay. Notice, what did Crayon do first? Saying a prayer to Hecate of the crossroads, Pluto too, to hold their anger and be kind, we washed the dead in a bath of holy water. Plucking some fresh branches, gathering what was left of him, we burned them all together, raised a high mound of native earth. Then we turned and went for the... Uh, Rocky Vault. We buried the body first, and then we went to get Antigone. And he says, and a long way off, we hear this wail, this crying. And we went in, and she's hanging, and Haman's still alive. Oh, my child, what have you done? What have you done? What seized you? What insanity? What disaster drove you mad? Come out, my son. I beg you on my knees. 13658. Uh, but the boy gave him a wild burning glance, spat in his face, not a word in reply, drew his sword. His father rushed out. Crayon thinks Haman's going to kill him. And instead, he goes up next to Antigone's hanging body and falls on his sword and dies with his arms clasped around her. And there he lies, body enfolding body, 1369. He has won his bride at last, poor boy. Crayon shows the world that of all the ills afflicting men, the worst is what? Lack of judgment. Go back to the beginning of the play. And Crayon's opening words. When he says not quite opening, 195 or so. Of course you cannot know a man completely, his character, his principles, sense of judgment, not till he's shown his colors, ruling the people, making laws. So, how well has he done showing his colors, ruling the people, making laws? He's an utter failure. Experience, there's the test. But he doesn't have any experience. He gets experience... Will Crayon, after all this, be a good ruler or a bad ruler? Well, if he learns from his experience, then he'll probably become a very good ruler. It's a big if. So, Crayon comes back in, escorted by attendants carrying Haman's body. The king, the leader says. Oh, so senseless, so insane, my crimes, my stubborn, deadly. Look at us, the killer and the killed. The killer. Crayon is taking Haman's death as his own action. Father and son, the same blood, the misery, my plans, my mad, frenetic heart, my son cut off so young. Leader, too late, too late. You see what justice means. Now the leader takes a position. Why? Well, there's not two sides to the argument. <laughs> the argument's been solved. The leader is showing how craven and courageless he is. Messenger comes out and says, um, I've got more to add to your plate. 1409. What now? What's worse than this? How can it get any worse? Your wife's dead. <laughs> the queen is dead. No, no. The door is open. They bring out Eurydice. What next? 1422, Crayon asks. What fate still waits for me? 
The Dread, uh, excuse me, page, uh, page 838, 1432. Oh, The Dread, I shudder with dread. Why not kill me too? Run me through with a good, sharp sword. He's saying, somebody, please, end it now. Oh God, the misery, anguish, I, I'm turning with it going under. Messenger, yep, yeah, the dead. Yes, and the dead, the woman lying there, piles the guilt of all their deaths on you. In other words, yep, yeah, it's your fault, Crayon. The I told you so moment. The guilt is all mine. Can never be fixed on another man, he says. No escape for me. I killed you all. I, God help me. I admit it. Take me away. I don't even exist. I'm no one. Nothing. Okay? Tragic heroes risen and now fallen and become nothing. Good advice if there's any good in suffering. Quickest is best. Quickest is best when trouble's blocked the way. He kneels in prayer. Come, let it come, that best of fates for me, that brings the final day, best fate of all. What's he asking for? Gods, take my life now. Why? Because tomorrow's going to be a hard day. And the day after that's going to be hard too. And the day after that, and every day from this point until he dies, will be agony for Crayon because his actions cause these deaths. Quickly now, so I never have to see another sunrise. The leader, who suddenly discovered wisdom. That will come when it comes. We must deal with all that lies before us. In other words, you'll die when it's time. Till then, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> the future rests with the ones who tend the future. The gods. I poured my heart into that prayer. I'm like, come on, take me. I'm really sincere. No more prayers. For mortal man, there is no escape from the doom we must endure. Endure. Okay? Read Shakespeare's King Lear. You hear very similar language from Gloucester after his redemption, after his change of heart. Take me away, I beg you, out of sight. A rash, indiscriminate fool. What does he mean by indiscriminate? What does it mean to be indiscriminate or take it apart? What does it mean to discriminate? See, we tend to think that this only has a negative term or a negative meaning, connotation to it. To be indiscriminate means to not be able to tell the difference. To discriminate means to tell the difference. To look at things as being different. Like I can discriminate between this dirty hoodie and this grade book, and this bag, and this envelope, and this marker, and this body, and this table. To be indiscriminate would be like, if I couldn't see, and all I could do was hear, and I just hear a bunch of voices. Okay. A rash, indiscriminate fool. Why does he call himself indiscriminate? Because he wasn't discriminating between his laws and the God's laws. He was confusing himself with the state. He was confusing what he said with morality. He was essentially making himself into a god and saying, I must be obeyed as a god. And Antigone was saying, no, don't think so. What was one of her arguments? I have to please those down there a lot longer than what? I have to please those up here. Chorus. Wisdom is by far the greatest part of joy. And reverence toward the gods must be safeguarded. That is, protected, defended. The mighty words of the proud are paid in full with mighty blows of fate. The chorus is saying, if you go off and you pop off and make these great boasts, guess what's going to happen? Fate is going to find a way to make you Prove those boasts. 
or fail. In other words, fate is going to test you. And at long last, those blows will teach us wisdom. What's the wisdom the blows of fate teach? Goes back to something else the leader said earlier. We have to endure. That's it. Hamlet's phrase, whether tis nobler or not to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or with a bare bodkin, a knife, to end them all in his so-called soliloquy in Act 3, Scene 1. It's not a soliloquy, by the way. There are other people on the stage in that scene. Okay. What's he saying there? Is it nobler to endure the problems of this life or to say, I'm checking out. I'm done. The leader says, guess what, folks? We don't have the choice. According to the gods, our task is to endure. It's to suffer. Where? How long? Till it ends. That's why the translation of Oedipus that I like reads at the end, count no man blessed until he is dead. Or another one, count no man happy until he is dead. Why? Because this place, this is, you know, Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. And the shadow of death affects what? Everything in life. Right. Stop with Antigone and turn to Plato. We can do at least the parable of the cave and maybe get into the apology. Because it's a nice, um, Antigone is a nice link, nice segue to Plato, because Plato is dealing with some of the same issues. I'm not going to read through. The Allegory of the Cave. How many of you have read this before? Or dealt with it in some fashion? What's the image he presents? Okay, a cave. you got people in a cave, and it's like this, and then it ascends, and then this is the opening of the cave. Right? And so you have a wall here, and you've got a group of people here who are sitting on chairs, And they're tied or chained. Behind them is a wall, right? kind of like this, look like this. And there are people walking here, carrying stuff, doing stuff. And behind them is a great big fire. Okay? Now, these people can't turn their bodies, can't move their heads. So what do they see projected on this wall? Shadows. They see the shadows of whatever is going on here. Shadows are caused by the, caused by the light of the flames, cast by these things. And these people are carrying, we are told, images of outlines of animals, bears, dogs, cats, giraffes, etc., other people. And these people are essentially fastened here from birth. So what is their understanding of reality? It's the shadows that they see cast on the wall. Do they know that there are these other people back here and that there is this fire? No, they don't. They don't hear them because these are silent. Nor do they know that they're in a cave. So what does Socrates say? Take one of these individuals, take his chains off or her chains off, and have them turn around. And what's the first thing that happens? Their eyes get temporarily blinded by this light. But that's we're not going to stop there. We're going to walk them up, and they're going to come out here, and what are they going to do? They're going to see the sun shining. What does this do to their eyesight? Blinds them. 
Okay? But the longer they are out here, what do they gradually come to see? I mean, they don't look at it for like minutes. It's what do they start to see? They see out here, for example, a real tree. Whereas back here, they saw somebody carrying something. So what does the real tree bear in relation to the shadow of the tree that they see? Color. Okay, color. What else? What else can they do here? Not only see it, they can touch it, they can feel it. Okay. But what else does the tree have? Dimensionality. It's three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional. What else? This is what kind of perspective or representation of this? It's a poor copy. Okay. So what's Socrates' point with the parable of the allegory of the cave? Notice this is from Book 7 of The Republic. The Republic is Plato's long work about what makes a proper state or city, if you want. Okay. And it's Socrates talking about the kinds of people that you want in the state. It's going to have philosopher kings. All right. So what's the purpose of the allegory of the cave? What is he saying about human life? Close, partially true. This is us. We are only seeing shadows. We live in this world of essentially copies or shadows. If you're familiar with C.S. Lewis, he called this world the Shadowland. Okay? So what's he mean? There's another world, another realm, a higher place. That is the place of or world of forms, ideals. Okay? And everything we see around us is a shadow of something in that world of forms or ideals. Why? Because essentially, the light of the sun is shining on those real things. These are real. Okay. These down here are copies. It's shining on these and what everything we see around us. In other words, this is a copy of a hoodie. In the world of forms and ideals, there is the ideal hoodie, or sweatshirt, as I'm used to calling it. What does it have? It has sweatshirtness to it. Similarly, the real table has tableness. It has all the characteristics that every table must have. For example, what are some of the characteristics of a table? Legs. It's got to have some kind of legs, right? Because if it doesn't have legs, what is it? It's something flat and poured on the ground. Okay? It's got to be elevated somehow off the ground. So it's got legs. What else does it have? It's got this part. It's got the horizontal flat part. Does the table have to be horizontal? Yes. In order for a table to serve its function, it can't be like this, right? Because the purpose of a table is to be able to sit at it and maybe eat off of it or work on it. It'd be kind of hard to eat off this because you set your bowl down, it goes right off, right? So it's got to be horizontal, flatness, relatively. Are there perfect tables that are, or are there tables that are not flat? Yes, there are. Why? Because they're copies. <laughs> the ideal of table, perfect flatness. Okay. What about something else? What about? Let's sit up here. 
Chairs. What does every chair have to have in order for it to meet the definition of a chair? <coughs> a seat. It's got to have the seat. <coughs> what about this? Does it have to have this? Yeah, ah, kind of interesting. What if it doesn't have this? Then what is it? Stool. Could be a stool. Does it have to have four legs? Not all chairs have legs. Rocking chairs, though the rocker is attached to legs, but you know, uh, lazy boys don't have legs, so to speak, but they are chairs kind of. Both of these things, you know, or even something like this, what are you getting at when you start to talk about the characteristics of it? Right? This is a bottle. What are the characteristics of a bottle? Notice this one's plastic. It should be squeezed, etc. Is plastic a prerequisite for bottleness? No. So what is a prerequisite for bottleness? Does a bottle have to have a lid? It has to have an opening so that something can be put inside. Can a bottle hold non-liquid? Could I fill this with sand if I wanted to? Yes, I could. I could create sand art. Right? So it is something that is usually circular in shape. Um, trying to get the right geometrical term. Not cylinder. conical. Like a cylinder. Cylinder, thank you. A cylinder. It has an opening at the top to hold material, whether that's liquid material or something else. Some people would say a bottle is also what? Narrowed at the top. Because if it's not narrowed, if this just went straight up and didn't have this kind of lid, but had a screw-on thing here, it would be more like a cup or jar. What's the difference between a bottle and a jar? One is narrowed, possibly, and the other one is not. So Socrates' point is that we live here, but with our minds, it is possible to break the chains and come out here. With our minds, it is possible to know the real reality. Have any of you ever read The Velveteen Rabbit? If you haven't, you should. Because The Velveteen Rabbit is about a little boy who gets sick, who has a favorite plush animal, a Velveteen Rabbit. Right? Velveteen is a kind of material, like velvet. Right? And he has this rabbit that he just loves. Takes it with him everywhere, out in the garden to play, blah, 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 blah. And the boy comes down with... Um, I don't remember what it is. Yellow fever or something like that. Typhoid, I think it is. Comes down with typhoid and they have to burn everything of his. Why? Because of the possibility that it's um, containing germs. And the Velveteen Rabbit gets thrown out with all this other stuff. Before the fire can come, okay, other rabbits come out to hop around in the garden at night, and the Velveteen Rabbit's lying there, and it sees him, and a rabbit comes up to him and says, you're not a real rabbit, because your arms don't move, your ears don't move. And the Velveteen Rabbit asks, what is real? Okay. Actually, this is before the fire scene. The Velveteen Rabbit gets left outside one night. The other rabbit comes up to him and asks, what is real? Because this rabbit says, you're not real. So he gets taken back inside to the nursery the next day after the boy finds him the next morning. This is before the boy is sick. And he talks to a, um, like a rocking horse that has, that's made out of leather and stuff that is worn thin. And the horse says, you are real when you become so worn from use and from love. The boy's father made me real. 
And then the rabbit gets taken out to be burned and stuff. And is made real just before the fire comes. So that he runs off and becomes a real rabbit. A little bit later, the boy is healed and he goes off. And he sees a rabbit in the thicket. And he says, that looks just like my rabbit that I lost. Okay? What's the whole point? Love is what makes things real. Okay? Socrates doesn't use this exact language. It will be used later by other writers. But that it's the what's called by another writer the ascent of love. Is how we get to the real up here. Because for Socrates, the thing that's up here, the thing that makes everything else have meaning is the good. The good. Good is a thing. It's not an adjective. What gets called the sumum bonum. The highest good. And this is what Socrates says. Everyone ought to try to achieve the highest good. Now the highest good is not the same thing for everybody. Right? So he goes around asking people questions to try to pull out of them what they know from their pre-existent souls of this state. Because according to Socrates, all of our souls existed before we were conceived. When we were conceived, our souls went down into those individual bodies. But those souls can remember things from this existence. It's why, for example, Wordsworth can write intimations of immortality. Because he's echoing on that. He's saying, you know, I kind of remember. I can't put it into words, but I remember this feeling, etc. Right? So Socrates went around asking questions. The kinds of questions we will see him address to some extent in the Apology. Okay? Look at page 1199. Um, and I'll finish with the Apology here, with the um, allegory here, and then go on to the Apology. So he explains everything that the allegory of the cave, he explains it to his disciple, his student, Glaucon. The prison house, this here, is the world of sight. That is, it's our world. The light of the fire, this, is the sun. The sun that we see. Not this sun that I was talking about. This is the sun, the light of the good. He doesn't use the language, but it's like he's talking about the monotheistic God. All right? The light of the fire is the sun. You will not misapprehend me if you interpret the journey upwards to be the ascent of the soul into the intellectual world according to my poor belief, which at your desire I've expressed. Whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. When he used God and it's capitalized like this, that's probably referring to Apollo. Okay? But whether true or false, my opinion is that in the world of knowledge, the idea of good appears last of all. Notice, the idea, the form, the ideal. Good is the highest of the ideals. Justice lies beneath that. Beauty lies beneath that. Truth lies beneath that. Okay? And is seen only with an effort. And when seen, when the idea of the good is seen, is also inferred to be the universal author of all things beautiful and right parent of light and of the Lord of light in this visible world. So notice, the good is essentially what Aristotle, the intellectual grandson of Socrates, will call the prime mover. That's Aristotle. That's not Socrates or Plato. Right? You have Socrates. His student was Plato. 
Plato's student was Aristotle. Anybody know who Aristotle's student was? Alexander the Great. Okay. Not a great philosopher, but, you know, conquered the known world. So he goes on. Parent of light and of the Lord of light in this visible world and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual. And that this is the power upon which he who would act rationally either in public or private life must have his eye fixed. In other words, if you are going to act publicly or privately, in other words, if you're going to live, this has got to be your focus. Socrates said, this is the achievement, the end of being. This is why we exist, to discover this, to get back to this, intellectually. Okay? It's a moral journey. That's why Socrates taught entirely about the virtues and ethics. Aristotle didn't do a lot with virtues and ethics. I know he wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, which we had a selection of, which we're not going to read. He was primarily what? He's called the first scientist. Because these two are dealing with the world of universals, ideals, forms. Aristotle is deal dealing with the world of particulars. These two are saying we can arrive at the world of universals. These things, merely through our intellect. Aristotle said, nope, can't do that. Only way you can arrive at the form of a tree, the form of tree, is by studying trees. Individual, particular trees. All trees. Only by studying as many different kinds of trees as you can, can you start to arrive at this idealized, generalized form. Because what if this was your only example of table? Or this was your only example of chair? What would you say, based on this, all chairs must be and all chairs cannot have? Well, this chair doesn't have a nice little thing so that you can recline in it, does it? No, it doesn't. So you would say, well, though, that cannot, something like that cannot be a chair. But if somebody else then brought one of those in, you'd have to go, huh, look at that. Those two things, and they are different. So what does that do? That broadens that frame of reference, and that then enables you to arrive at an ideal that has a little bit more information. That's why Aristotle said, you got to examine everything in life. You have to study, right? So he looked at individual things. Go to the apology. So, apology means defense. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm sorry, I won't go around and ask troubling questions anymore. It means, here's my defense. Here's why I go around asking troubling questions. Okay. Now you've got a long um, footnote. Socrates' trial occurred when he was 70 years old. Plato and most of his other followers were in their mid to late 20s by this time. And there's several mentioned here, Glaucon, Phaedo, Credo, etc., several others. So what's he tried for? I mean, he gives us some of the charges. And, and notice, by the way, in reading this, um, the way Plato describes the trial as happening implies that Socrates asks questions of the judges and there is either murmuring or he asks rhetorical questions and there is murmuring, murmuring or shouting or acclaim and he's like, you know, keep it down, let, let me go on. So, as if Plato is, is describing this thing has it really occurred, and we don't have quote-unquote historical documents that show that it really occurred, but most people think it did actually really occur, 
and that this is probably a pretty good reflection of what actually happened. Socrates wrote nothing. Nothing. Everything we have that we know about Socrates and by Socrates comes through his disciple Plato. Okay? The dialogues of Plato are not the dialogues of Plato, they're the dialogues of Socrates. Socrates talking to other people. So, he says, talking about the charges, pages 1200 and 1201. There's two kinds of charges against him. Of the many falsehoods told by them, that is, those who have charged him, there was one which quite amazed me. I mean when they said that you should be upon your guard and not allow yourselves to be deceived by the force of my eloquence. He's saying, and notice, what we have here is only his defense. We don't have the prosecution's words. Okay? Because it's an actual trial. So we have Socrates rephrasing what the prosecution essentially said. So what is one of the things they said? Don't listen to him. He's wily. He will use words and rhetoric to confuse you and persuade you. Well, what is the purpose of rhetoric? That's exactly what it is. It is persuasion. That is the whole purpose of rhetoric, to persuade. The whole reason you write papers in your classes is to persuade your professors, your readers, that you are right. It's not necessarily to persuade your professors that the professor is wrong, though it can be that at times. It's to persuade that here I have this idea, and this is a good idea, and this idea is right. So you do that a variety of ways. We're going to see Socrates use a variety of ways of doing that. He says, and I'm amazed that they would say that. To say this, when they were certain to be detected, as soon as I opened my lips and proved myself to be anything but a great speaker, what does he mean? Ah, oh, shut you I ain't that good a speaker. Shoot. That's what he's doing. He's saying, they have said, I am this great orator. I'm not really. That's rhetoric on his part. He is undercutting their argument. And yet, well, what are we going to see? Amazing rhetoric. Okay. Um, he goes on. As soon as I opened my lips and proved myself to be anything but a great speaker, did, appear, did indeed appear to me most shameless. Unless by the force of eloquence they mean the force of truth. If they mean that I'm eloquent to mean I tell the truth, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll accept that. For if such is their meaning, then I admit I am eloquent. But they have scarcely spoken the truth at all. For me, that's all you're going to get, the whole truth. So, he says, let me first address the older charges. That is, the charges not raised in this exact trial. And to my first accusers, which are not the three Specific accusers, Anatus, Miletus, and Lycon. For of old I have had many accusers who have accused me falsely to you during many years, and I am more afraid of them than of Anatus and his associates. Why? Because the older accusers are more dangerous, he says, who began when you were children. What is he implying? Some of you already hold biases against me. Some of you have been raised to think, oh, that crazy old Socrates, living in the clouds, not down here among the real world of men. Far more dangerous are those the others who began when you were children, took possessions of your minds with their falsehoods, telling of one Socrates, a wise man, who speculated about the heaven above. That's this. Okay? and searched into the earth beneath, and made the worse appear the better cause. Their hearers, 
The people who listen to that kind of talk are apt to fancy that such inquirers do not believe in the existence of the gods. That is, that people who raise those kinds of questions are atheists. And here's something else. I do not know and cannot tell the names of my accusers, he says in 1202 at the top, unless in the chance case of a comic poet. And if we had a longer semester, we would read Aristophanes' The Clouds, because he has a character in there named Socrates, who thinks he walks in the clouds, who thinks he's so far above everybody else, he can't have anything to do with the hustle and bustle of real life. So he says, I will ask you then to assume with me at the end of that paragraph, as I was saying that my opponents are of two kinds, recent and ancient. And I hope you'll see the propriety of my answering the latter, the ancient ones first, for these accusations you heard long before the others and much oftener. Why does he want to deal with those first? Because he's trying to root out of their minds this belief system they already have about Socrates. He's saying, I'm trying to level the playing field here for me a little bit. So, what's the accusation which has given rise to the slander of me? The accusation from the past. So what does Miletus and others say? Here's their affidavit. Socrates is an evildoer and a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in heaven, and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrines to others. There's five points to that. Such is the nature of the accusation. It's just what you yourselves have seen in the comedy of Aristophanes, and he mentions him by name now, who has introduced a man he calls Socrates, going about saying that he walks in air, talking a deal of nonsense, concerning matters of which I do not pretend to know either much or little. Not that I mean to speak disparagingly of anyone who is a student of natural philosophy. Natural philosophy. Stuff. He's talking about science. Okay? He's not a practitioner of natural philosophy. He's a practitioner of moral philosophy or ethical philosophy. You could even say epistemological theory of knowledge. So he says, I don't do anything with that stuff. So speak then those who have heard me and tell your neighbors whether any of you have ever known me hold forth in few words or in many upon such matters. That is, all of you here, and there are 500 men in this jury, 500 judges. He's saying, any of you who can say, I have held forth about this kind of philosophy, speak up. Now, he wouldn't make that kind of challenge unless what? Unless he's pretty damn sure he'd never spoken about any of this. Because all it would take is one to go, yeah, I seem to remember you talking about, and his whole argument would come down. So, as little foundation is there for the report that I'm a teacher and take money. Oh, how the world has changed, you know. This accusation has more truth in it than the other. Who were the teachers who took money in Socrates' day? The sophists, they took money for what? What did they teach? If we get our word sophistry from them. They taught logic and rhetoric. Brett cop people usually don't like you know, this discussion. Because what is he saying? The people who take money to teach logic and rhetoric, what are they doing? They're teaching logic so that logic can be twisted for the purposes of rhetoric. What are the purposes of rhetoric again? To persuade. See, the sophist taught you, I mean, it's what modern law school does. The sophist taught you to do what? Take a position on any subject, any position. Take both sides. Of an issue and be able to argue that. That's the whole purpose of debate. To be able to argue a position you don't personally hold and to win it using 
logic, and rhetoric. Socrates is like, that's not me, man. I don't go for that. Okay? So, we'll stop there. We will, we will pick up on Thursday, bottom of 12.02. We should be able to finish the apology. I wish we had the Phaedo in here, which is kind of a continuation where he talks more, gets into the really good stuff about the immortality of the soul.